Anybody ever feel like you're in the orange cell pile? Like you just ready to give it up? I'm going to do my drink. Coming in, Luke? Lukey. Hey, there's a chair up there. Don't you miss me? You, you need a chair? Yeah. That's cool. I just wanted to say everybody. Oh, your last face. Hey, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, Luke. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a comeback, but this is more of an underdog story. Everybody say, underdog. 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 All right, what is an underdog? Someone is underdog. Someone you never expect to win. Someone that's under it all. Uh, no, that is not right. But that actually, the origin of underdog did come from that. Can anybody explain that? Does anybody know? Where the word, actually the word underdog came from. Not the meaning. We know the meaning. It means you're kind of, you're not the, yeah, you're the little one. You're supposed to lose. You don't have a chance. But what does the word underdog come from? Glad y'all asked, I'll tell y'all. Uh, <laughs> underdog comes from a British term back in the day when they used to fight dogs. Everybody say, that's not good. That's not good. But they used to fight dogs, and the dog that won would be called the top dog. Anybody ever heard that term before? Matthew, you top dog. He's the top dog now. So if you're not the top dog, you're the underdog, which meant that you lost, which means you didn't have a fighting chance. And so that dog was referred to as the underdog. So today, when we talk about underdog, we talk about mainly about what, though? We talk about what's on your shirt. We have volleyball, we have basketball. So mainly sports is where we hear the term what? Underdog. So... Can anybody tell me an underdog story in sports that you can remember? <laughs> it can be like high school, it can be college, it can be... Anybody think of me? Come on, somebody. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. Everybody listen up. Last year, um, we lost nine people on varsity, all six seniors, and... Uh, like most of the boys at our school was like You're gonna almost every games. game. Yeah. And I know, right? Whoa. And, uh, <laughs> That's and we started out rough in the beginning, but we came through. Yeah. So you started out as an underdog. Come out yeah, that's good. Does anybody know who Mike Tyson is? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. So he was undefeated at one time. Nobody could knock him out. He probably couldn't get through the first round with this guy because uh, one punch from him and you were just, you were a pancake. You were out. But this guy named Buster Douglas knocked him out, knocked him out cold and he was considered an underdog. Uh, let's think of some more. We've got Miracle on Ice, which is NHL. That's one that everybody remembers. Uh, college basketball, there's a lot of underdogs because in the tournament you have March Madness. And so a lot of underdogs will defeat the top dog in a game. So we're going to talk about where is an underdog in the Bible. Has anybody ever heard the story of David and Goliath? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, come on now. So David was considered a what? Underdog. An underdog. A big time underdog. And he was about to face a giant named Goliath that was considered the top dog of the battle. And basically, moral of the story, to give you a summary of where we're coming to, there's two armies, one on either side, and they're wanting to fight. But nobody will fight this army because they have a man by the name of Goliath. And he said, Somebody meet me down in this valley. I'll fight you. If you beat me, you can have everything. If I beat you, you have to serve me. You have to serve our army. And basically, it was just pink slips. All right, here's, here's everything I have if we lose. And so nobody would stand up to Goliath. Nobody would take down Goliath because he was so massive. Has anybody ever had a, a, like a massive problem in your life or something come up? And it was you were afraid to kind of go after it. You were afraid to to be the underdog. Has anybody ever felt like an underdog before in life? 
Now I'm not talking about like sports where you're like, yeah, this one time I was playing this guy and he was like nine foot tall. And I shot it, it it's still flying, ball's still in the air. Yes, we've all felt like that. But I'm just talking about in life in general, guys, where you feel like an underdog because of the situations you're in or maybe because of what life is thrown at you, you feel like an underdog because of what you're going through. So I want to talk about that because David felt like an underdog. But we find out that he had the Lord on his side and that he knew everything was going to be all right because as long as he trusted in God, that he would come out victorious. So somebody say victorious. Victorious. So underdog means a competitor thought to have little chance of winning a fight or contest. And then we go to the origin. Uh, it says with reference... It's to the beaten dog in a dog fight. That's where the underdog came from. An underdog is a person or group in a competition, usually in sports or creative works, who is popular, popularly expected to lose. Has anybody ever expected you to lose in life? They just counted you out? Yeah. Because of maybe the, the way you've grown up, maybe because of things that's happened in your life, that you are just... Your life is, ex you're expected to lose. Just no matter what you do, people are always counting you out. People are always saying, you're not going to amount to anything. You're not going to make anything of yourself. You're expected to lose. And so David could have felt that way and been that way in his life. And how do you know that? Because in 1 Samuel 17, if everybody wants to turn there tonight, if you got your... Bible, if you like me, you got your Over, turn on, on your Bible. Turn on your Bible. <laughs> First Samuel 17. But we're I'm actually going to drop back a chapter, which y'all don't have to read along. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna share what it happened. Samuel was going to anoint the next king. So he went to Jesse's house and he said, Bring me all your sons, and I'm gonna anoint one of your sons. So all the sons were in the house, they brought them and and Samuel said, this, this is not everybody who is missing. And David was out in the field tending to what? The sheep. So he was a shepherd. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. And, and I know that a lot of y'all have heard this uh, story before. And I know that uh, there's a lot of great sermons on this story right here that talks about him being anointed as king. But David was not even considered to be the next one anointed as king. So he was expected to what? Lose. He was expected to be the one to not get anointed, to not be the one to make that next step. But God chose him to be the underdog for this certain situation that was coming up against Goliath that he knew nothing about in the future. He knew nothing about it at this point in time until we get to chapter 17. So we get to chapter 17, and David, they find out he can play a harp, he's got some instruments, he's got some skill, and so Saul brings him to the kingdom, and, and he's playing in the palace. So he's not in the king's seat, but he has made it to the palace. So he's enjoying life. Life is pretty good right now, but he is still considered the underdog. Because he's small. Anybody, is there any small people in here? Anybody under five foot? You're a small. <laughs> I have been. I, I love basketball, but I'm, my height is not. You know, I'm, I'm not the very best when it comes to my height in the basketball. So if I ever do a layup with a guy that's seven foot, it's probably going to go in the bleachers. Um, but I'm going to give you everything I got. But if you are seven foot in basketball, you have an advantage because of your height. You are not the small guy. You're not the underdog. You're going to be the top dog. So in life, some of us have, because of our life and where we have gone and the things we have been through, we feel like the small person. And sometimes we feel like, you know, the bigger person. We feel like we can handle something. But I want to talk to us tonight about being in David's shoes. So David goes to battle, and he's taking his brothers. He had eight brothers, and he's taking his brother's food in the battlefield. So he's not even supposed to be behind enemy lines. He's not even supposed to be in the fight. All he's doing is bringing some food. Anybody like food? Oh, we about to eat a little bit. So he's bringing them some food. They're fighting. Actually, they're not fighting. They're watching Goliath mock them. They're not even attempting to fight. So he shows up, 
And imagine this, he shows up to battle with the food, no weapons, no nothing but just a little sling that he had. And he gives them their food. And all of a sudden, we're going to read, this is where I want to start, if I can find it. Let's go back to... <coughs> Verse 22, so we're going to be in uh, 1 Samuel 17, chapter 17, verse 22. It says, David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. Tell, if you're going to be an underdog in the fight, first you've got to run to the what? The battle line. You can't be afraid to get in the battle if you're going to defeat a giant. If you're going to defeat a giant in your life, you cannot run from every battle in your life. You can't run from every circumstance and situation in your life. You have to face it with God's help. That's good. And you'll become victorious. But it said that he ran to the battle line. It says, uh, while he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard, when all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him, terrified. It says that he shouted his usual words. Anybody ever fought a giant that shouts the same words to you every day? The same battle every day. You wake up and you fight the same battle every day. And it's his usual words. But if we're going to be a David, the first thing David did, he was there to bring a meal to the army. Was he not? But what happened? He heard. Somebody say heard. Heard. He heard Goliath. That was the first thing. If he would have never heard Goliath, would he have defeated? No. And so what I'm trying to tell you tonight, everyone in here, guys, girls, that if you try to ignore your enemy, you'll never defeat. That's good. Yeah. That's good. If you try to ignore your battles, you'll never win. David could have said, ooh. I think I heard something, but I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm just going to keep on walking. I'm not supposed to be here. Here's your meal. Here's your meal. Here's your meal. All right, see y'all. I'm gone. <laughs> I'm going back to my sheep. And that's what he could have said, and he would have left. How many has ever done that before? You didn't want to start an argument. You didn't want to jump in the battle spiritually of what God has called you to do. And so instead... You just did the little thing that, that gets you by, like come to church on a Sunday. Here's Sunday. Oh, here's, that's good. here's Wednesday. That is good. But I'm not supposed to battle any more giants. I'll just come back on next Sunday and give them their next meal. And I'll get blessed out of that. No, there's a giant yelling at you. And if, if you're going to fight that giant, you have to unclog your ears spiritually and say, I can hear you, giant, and I'm coming after you. Oh, I'm good. coming to slay you. Because Goliath was... Basically, calling God all kinds of words, nasty words. And I don't know exactly, uh, they probably, I don't know if God put everything in the Bible about what he said, but what he said just in there is pretty bad enough about what he said about God. And so David said, that's my God. That's my God that he's talking about. And I'm not going to put up with that. And all the other guys in the army sat there for 40 days. They said they sat there for 40 days as Goliath came down to the valley. So here's two armies, one right here and one right here. And Goliath walked down to the valley for 40 days, 40 days. And he said, hey, come on, who wants to fight me? And he would curse God and curse the army and curse God's, God's uh, soldiers. And they wouldn't do anything about it. But David heard Goliath. So what does David do? I'm glad you asked. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. That's a pretty good deal if he kills a lot. David spoke to the men who were standing with him, What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 27, it says, The troops told him about the offer, concluding, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. And David's oldest brother, Eliab, listened, and as he spoke to the men, and he became angry with them, 
Why did you come down here, he asked. Who did you leave those few sheep with in, with in the wilderness? So they, David's brother was mad that he was there, that he showed up. And guys, I can tell you there's going to be some people when, when you begin to fight Goliath and begin to fight the battles in your life, there's going to be some people that jump with you and help you, and there's going to be some people that tell you that you just need to stop. You need to go back to what you were doing. But no, God has called you to more. God has called you to do more in this fight. Uh, you know, sometimes you want to minister to people in your school. That's a big Goliath. There's a lot of students at your schools. And so you start ministering to one or two, and then you have that student or friend that comes up to you and says, man, don't even try. You should go back to what you were doing. It's not going to do any good for you to fight this giant. But no, God has called us, every student in this building, to fight that giant. That giant at your school, that giant at your home, that giant... Uh, that's in your life, that fights you every day, that wakes up and yells words at you, you are meant to fight that giant. You were meant to fight that battle, just like David did. He says, David, uh, he said, what, what have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to the others in front and asked about the offer. The people gave him the same answer as before. What David, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul so he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, Don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. David said, I'll, I'll do it. But Saul replied, You can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth. How many, how many have had that happen in your life? Somebody told you you're not old enough yet to, to be doing that for God. You're not old enough yet to make decisions on your own. You're not old enough yet to do this or to do that. Yes, you are old enough. You're old enough to serve God. If, if you're old enough to breathe, if you can breathe and you have lungs, you need to serve God with everything you have. And God will use you. And God's going to use David. We're going to go on down just a little bit. I know we're short on time. How much time do you have? One minute? Oh, well. Real short. Oh, well. Okay, so Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. He's about to fight this battle against Goliath. And this is the part I want to get to. It says that Saul had his own military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. So he took them off and he said, I'll go the way that, that I know to fight. I can't wear all this heavy equipment. So Goliath was wearing what? Armor. He had a sword. He had everything. And the enemy was wearing armor. And what I'm trying to tell you tonight, and this is the main point I want to get, we know that David defeated Goliath. But would have David ever defeated Goliath with that armor on? And I think we could all agree that he would not have been able to defeat Goliath. He would have been too heavy. He would have been out of his comfort zone, and he was trying to fight the enemy with enemy battle, with enemy armor. And so the enemy had armor, and David had no armor. What I'm trying to tell you tonight is that you can't fight alcohol in your home and your family with alcohol. You can't fight drugs with drugs. You can't fight sin with sin. That's good. It won't ever work. Mm -hmm. And David knew that. I can't fight this giant. He's wearing armor, but I'm not supposed to wear the armor. I have the armor of God. And I don't need all this stuff that's going to weigh me down because I will lose this fight because I'm trying to fight the way that he fights. And if you try to fight the battle in your life the way that it's fighting you, you will lose every time. Why do you think so many people that they have families and they have home lives that have drugs and alcohol and then when they get old enough, they turn to drugs and alcohol. You can't fight it that way. You will never win. Right. You can't fight hate with hate. You can, it will never work. Christ wants us to fight with, with victory. And the only way we can fight is by through him and through the blood and through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And so David fights with what he knows will work. And he says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And with a sling. And he has three stones and he slays the giant. But not only that, what does he do after he slays the giant? He falls down. He takes the enemy's sword and goes and cuts his head off. I know that sounds gruesome, but spiritually, guys, you're going to knock your giant down to the ground. You're going to knock him out once or twice. But you've got to come to the conclusion that you're going to finish that battle. 
Just because you knock that giant down one time, you've got to go and take the sword and cut it off. You've got to say, I'm done with this battle. I'm done fighting what, I, what the devil's trying to throw at me. I want to win, and I'm going to win by fighting with the Lord. And so, guys, I know that, what do we got, one minute, four minutes over? I think we're about to end right now. <laughs> I just seen it go one second. I want to encourage y'all tonight, um, and this is kind of different, because last year we did all the fun stuff, and then we had Bible, so we're doing Bible first this time. I want to encourage y'all to be like David. Not to be of the world. He could have come to that battle and he could have put on the same armor that everybody else was wearing and he would have lost. I encourage y'all, be different. Fight the life. Fight the battles at your schools. Fight the battle at your home. But fight it through the Word of God. Fight it with what God says to fight it with. Don't fight it with hate. Don't fight it with alcohol. Don't fight it with drugs. Don't fight it with... with uh, trying to hurt yourself or, or depression or things like that, it will never work. It will never work. You have to fight the battle with the Lord. And that's what David remembered. He remembered, if I fight this battle and I put God on my side, I will be victorious every time. How many wants to be victorious in the fight? Please be yeah. All right, I want us to just uh, pray real quick and we're going to dismiss. If everybody will repeat after me. I said, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I love you. And I thank you. And I thank you for sending your son Jesus. For sending your son Jesus. To die on the cross. To die on the cross. For my sins. For my sins. Today. Today. I accept you. I accept you. Into my heart. Into my heart. As my personal. As my personal. Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. I believe. I believe that you rose from the grave. That you rose from the grave. And that you're in heaven today. That you're in heaven today. I want you to come into my life. I want you to come into my life and help me fight the giants. And help me fight the giants that I face every day. That I face every day. I thank you. I thank you. And I praise you. And I praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to the gym. So if you.